It's March 2005 at a US State Department briefing in Washington, D.C. Journalists gather to ask questions about the ongoing war in Iraq. Also on the agenda, U.S.-India relations. The issue of this visa, frankly, I think should be separated entirely from uh, the broader issue of U.S.-India relations. Why? Because it's, it's a specific case dealing with a specific visit. It has nothing to do with bilateral relationships. Relations. A controversial has... Indian politician's visa has just been revoked by the U.S. government under a law that restricts visas for individuals accused of severe violations of religious freedom. The visa that uh, Chief Minister applied for was, was not given because uh, the purposes of his visit did not coincide with the type of visa that he was requesting. And also, an existing visa was revoked uh, because under the terms of... Governments from the European Union and the UK will then follow suit, enacting an unofficial diplomatic boycott against the same man. The, 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 the person in question did not, did not qualify for a visa given his, the findings of Indian commissions in investigating uh, actions or lack of actions by state institutions in religious conflict in, in Gujarat state. That man is Narendra Modi. So why was India's prime minister once shunned by world leaders? and banned from the US for almost a decade. We want them to hear that in Mumbai. Let's do it again. Namaste, Wembley. Team India, Prime Minister Modi, a huge welcome from Team UK. And why, like David Cameron at London's Wembley Stadium in 2015, are world leaders now trying to bask in his popularity? I said to my friend, the Prime Minister, before the last time I saw someone on the stage here was Bruce Springsteen, and he didn't get the welcome that Prime Minister Modi has got. Prime Minister Modi is the boss. From the lands of the Kulin Nation, my name is Emma Hoy. This is Leave It to the Experts. Welcome to episode three of our in-depth look at the Indian election. This time we're looking at the leading man in this Indian epic, Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi's journey has humble beginnings, and while some question marks linger over his origin story, either way, it's a remarkable tale. The son of a chaiwala, or tea seller, rises to lead the world's most populous nation. This gentleman's telling me that he thinks Modi can save the country. So how did he get there? To make sense of it all, let's go back to the very beginning, to uncover Narendra Modi's identity, motivations, and the people who helped him on his way to the top. Let's start with where he comes from. Gujarat, a state on India's west coast. It's a very vibrant state culturally. And uh, what struck me when I first went there from the northeastern part of the country, so the food is different. The culture is very colorful. The Navratri is the major festival. It's nine nights of uh, dancing, actually. That's 360 Info editor Samrat Chaudhry. He lived in Gujarat for many years and describes the man they call Modiji, a term of respect in Hindi. It is also known for its uh, people's trading acumen, two richest Indians, Mr. Abani and Mr. Adani, both happen to be Gujarati. So that has always been a feature. As a state, Gujarat has historically punched well above its weight, but uh, Gujarat, even at the time of India's independence, had some of the most influential leaders, for example, Mahatma Gandhi, but also the father of the Pakistani state, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, was also Gujarati. So his biographies have been, several biographies have been written and his, his uh, growing up stories that he rose from very humble beginnings. The son of a tea seller came from a caste which traditionally of a uh, business of selling cooking oil. The point where he starts to become involved in politics is when he joins the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's first encounter with the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh occurred when he was just eight years old. Now he is one of India's most successful self- And then he rose to the ranks of the RSS when he became a full-time RSS Pracharan. He was mentored by a man who was then the head of the uh, RSS in Gujarat, 
no, this started at the bottom of the rung, uh, sort of, you know, making tea in the RSS uh, office over there and sweeping the floor. And so basically, he really started at the bottom. But his political activism sort of took off during the emergency which was imposed in 1975 by the then track minister Indira Gandhi. Over midnight on June 26th, 1975, the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi made this announcement that you're about to hear on the All India Radio. The President has proclaimed emergency. This is nothing to panic about. These words spelled do So, uh, during the emergency, the RSS was banned and, and so that is when he became fully involved in proper politics, political activity. He became known as a very good organizer. 1986-87 movie was sort of brought in, brought into the regime. Through the 90s, he was known as an organizer. But those were the years when India was seeing a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of turbulence. So that is when Hindu religious politics really takes off. Modi was not known to people in general. He was not a public figure at that time. I was there in Gujarat from 1993 onwards for seven years. I remember that at that time, Keshubai Patel was the chief minister. He was the big leader of the time. And Shankar Singh was his nearest rival. And uh, Modi was just a sort of, he was a backroom boy. That he's not come from any political dynasty. He's a self-made man. He's risen from nothing. And those stories, I think, have got its own endure. In early 2001, Gujarat was in crisis. A 7.6 magnitude earthquake tore through the state, with death toll estimates ranging from 13,000 to 20,000 people. The devastation wrought by India's earthquake is worst here, in the town of Bhuj, just miles from the quake's epicentre. With the incumbent Sir, BJP government beginning to feel the political toll. Eventually, the party infighting was quenched by a compromise candidate, Gujarat's own Narendra Modi. Modi would become Gujarat's longest-serving chief minister, staying in the role until he was elected prime minister in 2014. But a crisis almost ended his leadership career just months after it began. A train was set on fire in the city of Godhra. Inside, there were Hindu pilgrims. 59 of them died in that attack. It's February 27, 2002. A fire breaks out on a passenger train packed full of Hindu pilgrims in Godhra, a municipality in Gujarat. Right-wing politicians blame Muslims living in this area, and India saw its worst sectarian violence in years. To this day, the origin of the fire and whether it started from within a train compartment or whether it was intentionally and maliciously lit is debated. At the time, a New York Times report from the incident said, an angry Muslim mob set fire to a train loaded with Hindu activists. The passengers were returning from a pilgrimage to the site of the demolished mosque at Ayodhya, that we mentioned in episode two. Riots break out across the state, triggering violence that will claim the lives of more than a thousand people over the next few months. Six persons have been killed since last night. This morning, a hotel and other establishments were set on fire. Curfew has been clamped in many parts of Ahmedabad and Vadodara. Thousands of homes burned down. Gujarat locals claimed that the police did little to offer those being attacked, as the violence displaced families of all Similar faiths. Stories how their men were rounded up, detained and arrested nearly nine years ago. And their case centres around this one incident. Years later, in a BBC documentary, former UK Foreign Secretary Jack Straw would claim that the British believed Hindu nationalists aimed to purge Muslims from Hindu areas and that it all had the hallmarks of an ethnic cleansing. That documentary is now banned in India. Throughout the riot period, the new Chief Minister Narendra Modi became a lightning rod in the middle of this storm. Later, he's accused by a senior police official in a statement to the Supreme Court to have said that the Hindus should be allowed to vent their anger in response to the train fire. Modi is also accused by segments of the media and the government of not doing enough to stop the, the violence. Media, sitting Chief Minister Narendra Modi has been questioned on the role of his government in mass murders in connection with the post-Godra riots in Gujarat. He denies this, 
and will later be cleared through a special investigation. You see, there's no reason for him to say sorry. Why would he say sorry if, the, if, it's, if he was not responsible for it? And if he was responsible for it, then why has nothing happened? Yet Modi's public speeches and comments in the media are seen as inflammatory. After the violence ceased, Modi was banned from entering the US, the UK, and a series of European nations. The US State Department has categorically said that its visa policy in Narendra Modi's case remains unchanged. That clearly means that there is still no surety on whether Narendra Modi is visiting the United States. The international reaction was deafening, and the Prime Minister was prepared to sack Modi. His career appeared over. In a meeting of the BJP's national executive, Modi offers his resignation. But many in that room are Modi fans who, along with the Home Minister heavyweight LK Advani, force a backtrack from the PM. Modi survives and instead is told to hold an early election. So Modi runs and he wins convincingly. He hones his campaign based on religious polarisation, feeding the Hindu nationalist base exactly what it wants to hear at a time of heightened tensions. In later years, he will also be cleared by the courts of any involvement in the 2002 Gujarat riots. It reopens the possibilities for his ambition and sets the blueprint for decades to come. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Andrew Jaspin and I'm the founding editor and director of 360 Info. At 360 Info, we're providing evidence-driven, solution-based journalism, all written by leading experts. Every week, we release new and innovative news content that bridges the gap between the world's brightest minds and the global public. To be part of the fight against misinformation, sign up for our newsletters and follow us on social media or head to 360info.org. If you're a journalist or a publisher or editor, you can sign up for our Newswise service, which is free of charge at newshub.360info.org. So how does a man who is best known for sectarian politics convince hundreds of millions of Indian voters that there is more depth to Narendra Modi than what they've seen in Gujarat? In episode two, we spoke almost exclusively about the way Narendra Modi has leveraged religion to generate the Hindu nationalist strongman image that has paved his way to electoral success. So Modi targeted the nation's hip pocket, staking himself as an economic magician who would revolutionise the economy his rule in Gujarat shaped what would become known as Modi-nomics. The Indian economy is doing well. I am more optimistic today about India as a whole. Harnessing a pre-existing culture of entrepreneurialism and wealth in Gujarat, as well as a business-friendly environment across India, economists would sing Modi's praises, seeing near double-digit growth in Gujarat's economy, well above the national average. Already one of the more industrialised states in India, Gujarat has become home to auto manufacturers and other growing industries. Modinomic's success continued throughout the next decade of the Gujarat chief minister's career and into his prime ministerial election wins. Whatever violence and animosity Modi was linked to was balanced for many Indian voters by the economic gains and efforts through financial inclusion programs like Jan Dan Yojana, which gave millions of Indians their first chance to open a bank account. Under Modi's rule, India has become far more online and digital payment systems have been rolled out across the country. For many, this is a balancing weight against the sharper edges of his RSS, Hindu nationalist ideology, that remains the North Star of his political personality. As we heard in episode one, when Modi won the election in 2014, he capitalised on a lagging economic model. Over the next decade, with Modi in charge, India has gone from the world's 10th largest economy to fifth. India will be the third largest economy soon. India, which is set to grow more than 6% this year, that's more than any other major economy. And the GDP growth rate that has been released by the government has exceeded expectations. The financial year 2020... He also pushes India further into global affairs, harnessing better relations with the United States while balancing its relationship with Russia. All of it done while promising to place India as the new centre of global trade and investment. Whether the Modi economic agenda was his party's success alone, or the inevitability of a more globally facing Indian economy, the economy is heating up. 
and the visa bans from countries across the world are now a distant memory. Is this a long shadow hang hanging over this relationship because our current Prime Minister is somebody who was denied a visa by the United States of America? Um, I am very hopeful that the new government with its very large majority will be able to take uh, actions that will improve the economy, uh, strengthen uh, the foundations uh, of economic growth and prosperity broadly based for uh, the Indian people. Despite some protests in the UK, Modi was welcomed with open arms in the UK in 2015. David Cameron welcomes Modi to Wembley with tens of thousands of screaming fans. Namaste, Wembley! A travelling UK dignitary claims that the English city of Leicester is home to the largest Gujarati population outside of the Prime Minister's home state. Modi and his team intertwine the Prime Minister's name with successful policy choices as a swath of deregulation and tax reform unlocks Indian businesses to the world. And the world comes running. Now, India's growing prominence as a manufacturing hub gets yet another confirmation. According to a Reuters report quoting a source, Tesla has proposed to set up a factory to produce electric cars for local sales. The Modi government's Make in India initiative brings manufacturing powerhouses to India. Apple, Samsung, Amazon and Tesla all enter the market. At the turn of the decade, now in his second term, Modi is a made man. In 2020, Donald Trump visits the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, where he trips over the names of India's beloved cricket stars. But no one seems to mind. The world's greatest cricket players, from Suchin Tendulkar to Virat Kohli. In 2023, Joe Biden invites Modi to the White House to address the US Congress, where his name is chanted and he's given standing ovations. In November, Modi's name is again in front of billions. This time, it's the Cricket World Cup, hosted in India. We booked tickets now long back, a month back, that India will be into the final. And we make the November final is one for the ages. An undefeated, red-hot Indian team squared off against five-time champion Australia. We are in the biggest coliseum in the world. It's the gigantic Narendra Modi Stadium. Gujarat is firmly cemented as the centre of the cricketing world. More than 130,000 people are packed into the Narendra Modi Stadium, and a global audience of more than a billion watches on. In the eyes of some, the entire World Cup had become marketing for Modi's re-election. Down the pitch, down the ground, four, first boundary off the bat of Rohit Sharma. Australia would go on to win the final, but Modi and his home state of Gujarat had already won big. Thanks to the marketing blitz, Gujarat became firmly cemented at the centre of the cricketing world, and directly tied to that, the name Narendra Modi. Gujarat is where Modi grew up, where he launched his career in politics, and the state he became Chief Minister of in 2001. It's also where he first drew power from, helping build the electoral juggernaut of the BJP that led him to become the party's second ever Prime Minister. Just over two decades after offering his resignation as Gujarat Chief Minister, the son of the Chaiwala steams on from Vatnagar Station to the US Capitol building and Westminster's Houses of Parliament, all willing to do business with him. The world is at his feet, and the question marks from 20 years ago are just memories of a scattered past, lost in the wake of a man who is trying to shape India in his image. That soaring tale of overcoming expectations doesn't mean Modi is assured of a third run as Prime Minister. So let's fill in the gaps about who this man is and who helped bring Narendra Modi to the top. For that, we have AJ Gudavati, the Associate Professor at the Centre of Political Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, a columnist and seen in media across the world. Thanks for joining us on Leave It to the Experts. How are you seeing the campaign so far and what trends are you seeing on the ground? Uh, this has been... Uh... I refer to it as a, a boringly interesting election because uh, no, it's been very it's been a great period of lull. Uh, the election is waveless. Uh, the is uh, election is issueless, uh, and there is a, a perceptible decline in the voting percentage in the first four phases, anywhere between three to six percent. And much of this voting percentage drop has been noted in areas where BJP had won uh, in 2019. You had seen a 10-year uh, high decibel mobilizational 
you know, kind of governance by Mr. Modi. All through 10 years, it was like a referendum style mobilization of one on one issue after another on Mandir, then Article 370 and one after another, UCC, the Common Civil Code and so on and so forth. Uh, when election comes, so suddenly the national narrative seems to have been replaced by uh, multiple localized narratives and that uh, the uh, opposition seems to be sensing a chance because the elections have moved away from uh, um, Mr. Modi's persona and uh, in terms of uh, missing national narrative. And I think uh, Modi's own campaign has been a struggle in terms of bringing back these two things, focus on to himself, his leadership style and setting a national narrative. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you've just said that, you know, Modi's previous strategies, um, that kind of secular division, um, which worked so well in the past for him is no longer as successful now. Um, so if we could go back in time to when it was working really well and, you know, he had this incredible level of popularity that I think a lot of political leaders around the world would be so jealous of, why do you think that worked so well then and why do you think there are cracks appearing in that strategy now? Well, that, I think that question is right at the heart of uh, understanding uh, the Modi model of governance. Uh, Modi was always known for a certain kind of a deft combination of polarized, heightened, hyper-nationalist narrative with a high-growth kind of a development model, he was promising. So Hindutva, the idea of the Hindutva on the ground, uh, actually had multiple meanings. A high-growth, uh, greater economic mobility, uh, greater infrastructure, urbanization, massive job opportunities, scaling up Indian economy on the global level, alongside which, uh, you know, he could project that the only obstruction to all of this in the Indian case is the Indian Muslim. So these two narratives got fused in the popular Hindu majoritarian mind. Ten years of his governance, uh, there is definitely backsliding of the Indian development story. We are facing 45-year all-time unemployment. There is massive inflation. Uh, then there is uh, massive corruption charges now that are being uh, you know, alleged against him after the uh, electoral bonds. Uh, uh, so given all this and uh, the fact that he is not even promising anything dramatic on the economic front, you cannot possibly expect people to make hyper jingoistic claims uh, with uh, sliding economic opportunities. Uh, BJP voters uh, who do this, you know, in spite of whatever the economy, whatever the other things, uh, Modi is the only choice. But for the bulk of people, uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric worked only when development promise uh, uh, was kept up. Uh, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So what I'm hearing is that Modi hasn't fulfilled the two great promises that he made to the vast majority of the Indian population, obviously leaving out um, the Muslim populations and other minorities that he has ostracized throughout his campaigning. But I think that, you know, in modern politics, as in older politics as well, great power and wealth and political success kind of tend to go hand in hand. So um, I'd like to look at some of the great winners of, you know, Modi's um, time in office, which have been some of the wealthiest Indians in the country. You know, wealth inequality is, is rising rapidly in India. It's it's terrible. Um, so who are some of the really powerful friends, the powerful wealthy friends surrounding Modi? You know, what is the influence of some of the people like Adani and Ambani and, and how do these great relationships work in his favor politically? Well, that's the uh, shift Modi uh, brought in. Though under Congress rule, uh, no, there was a healthy competition between industrialists. O obviously, Congress is also pro-capitalist. They are the ones who introduced the neoliberal model of development in 1990s, privatizing and commercializing public goods like education and uh, health. So Congress uh, had the sense to have one multiple you know, industrialists have a healthy competition which gave a certain state autonomy in policy making. Second, Congress offset the uh, ill effects of uh, this kind of a neoliberal model of growth by uh, also legislating massive 
welfare policies. So India must be the only uh, anomalous global case where there was actually expansion of rights and welfare at the time of height of neoliberal reforms after 1990 economic reform. And that's where uh, it gave a momentum for a more aspirational mobility uh, for Mr. Modi. And that is the imagination Mr. Modi captured that Congress gave only subsistence and I'm going to open, you know, the sky is the limit. And that's, the, that's where he brought in an aggressive neoliberal crony capitalist model with just two industrialists, Mr. Ambani and Adani. So from uh, you know, capitalism, he shifted it to monopoly capitalism. From neoliberalism, he shifted it complete to crony capitalism. As you know, Arundhati Roy once mentioned that his two people are willing to sell everything and two people are buying everything and all four come from Gujarat. It was Ambani who was the first person to suggest at a corporate global gathering in Gujarat, uh, uh, Mr. Modi's name for Prime Minister's candidate. Even during 2014 initial campaign, Mr. Modi openly traveled in Adani's aircraft. He had no qualms about it. Even in a recent interview, he said that he, has, uh, he is not scared or he does not shy away from showing his proximity and friendship with big-time industrialists because he sees them as wealth generators. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, I guess that's, I mean, it's very astounding just that the BJP is now the richest political party in the world. And I guess, you know, that's one way in which um, Mr. Modi's political uh, system is kind of, some critics say, is undermining India's democratic credentials. Uh, another um, element of that is press freedom in India. You know, we in Australia are very attuned to this at the moment because one of our uh, international correspondents was just kicked out of India for critical reporting of the Modi government. Um, but India's uh, press freedom rating has been declining for many years now. Um, so on the ground for you, have you notice that shifting media environment and, you know, what impact is that having on this election? Uh, India was known to have had a reasonably free and fair and qualitative journalism. Now, we have a very well-known journalist who are, who are outspoken. Uh, their quality of coverage was excellent, comparable to any global corporation. In the last 10 years, uh, that has taken a plummet. And most 80 to 90 percent of air time has been exclusively given to this Hindu Muslim bashing. People just talking without any evidence. So media in terms of an electronic media has been worse. Print media, I would say slightly better. But many of us, I used to write very regularly to all major news dailies, uh, editorials. Uh, but uh, no, much of it does has come down. You know that I wouldn't say it's completely gone. But uh, most of National dailies have marked many of us out. Uh, we don't, we cannot contribute to many of the even dailies that are otherwise considered to be maintaining some amount of autonomy, like the Hindu and the Indian Express. I'd see a qualitative change. You know, recently a journalist did uh, a, a kind of a, a quick snap survey of the editorials of the National Daily Indian Express, and he found an astounding outnumber contributions by BJP MPs and officials. Mm, it seems like the end of this enormous era might be closer than we think, you know, given the incredible level of influence that Narendra Modi has had over the Indian political system for the last decade, if not more. It seems difficult from the outside to imagine life after Modi. Um, but that time will come and, it, you know, it might come sooner than we think. Um, I know that Delhi's chief minister has claimed that Amit Shah may succeed Modi next year if the BJP takes office. Uh, Modi's rejected that. But, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about who Amit Shah is and is he the likely successor? Well, I mean, I don't think uh, there is much point talking about a successor right now because I don't think as long as Modi is on the horizon, there is no way he's letting away power to anybody else. Of course, his closest aide is Mr. Amit Shah. Uh, Mr. Modi and Amit Shah worked very closely since the days of uh, his being chief minister in Gujarat. And, and much of the organizational work 
managing BJP, ticket distribution, uh, security related issues are all taken care by Mr. Amit Shah. Therefore, uh, he is a natural, uh, there is no doubt, he would be the natural successor of Mr. Modi, uh, only if Modi let go. So the point is, so uh, I don't see Modi giving up power uh, if he wins in third term, he will be 80 by the fourth term. Uh, uh, and it looks difficult for the regime to continue this way. Though, I, I should add, hasten to add that, you know, things don't remain the same under a Modi regime. They always make preparations for the next elections soon after they win these elections. Do you think that Narendra Modi and the BJP will willingly give up power? Or do you think that India's democracy is, is stronger than what some critics say are their slightly authoritarian tendencies. Well, that is the uh, that's a very complex and a tricky question. You know, there are two sides to that question. That uh, given the nature of leadership that Mr. Modi and Amit Shah presented, I don't see any chance of they willingly giving up anything. Now they would uh, no uh, no it will go down to the wire. They will leave no stone unturned to keep latch on to the power. But it's difficult to see India go the Russian way, the Putin way, or the uh, Turkish way. There is no way uh, India can be managed under some kind of, you know, authoritarian, dictatorial, civil, even if it is to be civil dictatorship. So I don't think uh, the current regime or the RSS that is backing uh, the BJP would go that far. All that they want to do is to con gain a control through seemingly legal means. So the, I don't think we are going in terms of an open dictatorship. I also don't buy the argument that, that they are going to abandon the constitution and they're going to something, you know, even that I don't see happening because they don't need to do that. They will win elections in an electoral manner, but which, which, which is free, but not fair. So this is, I know when we often say free and fair, I say Indian elections are continuing to remain free. People are free to vote, but the impact and outcome of that would have been subverted. That even if 80% of the nation decides to throw out uh, Mr. Modi's government, you electorally manufacture through institutional design such a way that you remain in power with 20% mandate. Mr. Pravati, I think we will leave it there. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Speak again soon. Thanks, Emma. That's it for this episode of Leave It to the Experts. Next episode, we'll look at India's race to become a superpower and what stands in its way. As the country pulled millions out of poverty, it does so becoming more unequal every day. So will economics deliver India its might or will its exposure to the changing climate alter its course? For in-depth coverage of India's elections, head to 360info.org. You can sign up for our newsletters and newswire for journalists and understand our work to fight against misinformation with university experts worldwide. This episode of Leave It to the Experts was produced by Michael Joyner, Reese Hooker and Lachlan Caselli. I'm your host, Emma Hoy. See you next time.